Hello, this is a talk about HTTP2 and HTTP2 support in Go 1.6. Uh, I'm Brad Fitzpatrick, I work on the Go standard library, and I've been working on Go and hacking on Go for about six years. Um, in previous life, I did stuff like LabJournal and Memcached. The talk is first about HTTP2 itself, and then the second part will be about how Go's HTTP2 support is integrated into Go. So it's a bit of a history, starting with Gopher and then talking about the various versions of HTTP. Uh, the very first version that kind of resembles HTTP was the Gopher Protocol, about 1991. The part in red here is what your browser or Gopher client would send, it's requesting the path reference. Notice there's no verb, or there's no protocol version, there's no headers. And the server would reply with a bunch of a listing of documents. The little part in blue here would be the uh, like the metadata or the content type, where the content type was one byte, and there would be a type for text or another directory or an HTML page or like a image. And then at the end, the server would disconnect after you've made that request. HTTP 0 0.9, um, also about the same time, just about a little after, you could uh, put a verb there now. So you could do like posts. And still no content type. Um, still no, you know, request headers, and at the end the server would reply and disconnect. HTTP 1.0 added a version number, and now you have headers, and you also have response headers, so you can say the content type. You don't have to assume it's HTML. HTTP 1.0 evolved a little bit. Now you could have a connection header, and you could say that you want to keep alive. And now notice down here we use the same TCP connection to make the subsequent request. And I have a typo here, and it's 1.1. Should be 1.0. Uh, HTTP 1.1 comes along, and now the connection keep alive is implicit, and you have to say connection close if you actually want to kill the connection at the end. Um, you can also say chunked now, so you can have requests and responses that don't have a known length, and you don't have to kill the TCP connection to signal the end. Um, and TCP, or HTTP is really easy to do by hand. You could just telnet to a server, and just type it. Host names are required in HTTP 1, and there's our IP address. And then you could do additional requests on it, get other answers. So this is what HTTP looked like in, one, in 1999. The problem is that HTTP 1.1 and 1.0 only really let you do one thing at a time, and there's lots of uh, setup. That setting up a new TCP connection is slow. Uh, there's lots of round trips involved. There's no way to gracefully shut anything down. And the protocol is basically just filled with nasty hacks and special cases from years of incompatibilities. Um, HTTP 1.1 does have a feature called pipelining, which clients and servers are basically required to support. And in theory, it lets you do your slow TCP setup and your slow TLS setup once. And then once you have your connection live, then you could send all your requests and get all the responses in order. The problem is it doesn't actually work in practice because middleware on the internet breaks it all. So in practice, all the browsers have it disabled because proxies are annoying and they break everything. So the rule of the internet is basically you have to speak very basic TCP or very basic HTTP on TCP port 80, or you can do TLS HTTPS requests on TCP 443 and if you try to do anything else, firewalls will block you. But fortunately, because of games and voice over IP things, UDP also works. Uh, from 1999 to basically 2013, nothing really happened with HTTP. Um, people tried to do pipelining with HTTP 1.1, but that didn't really work. So people started just increasing the number of connections that you could do at a time. Browsers first did two, could permit two connections to a server, then it was six. And people started doing hacks, like if you needed more than six connections to a server, you would just start making up new host names, and then your browsers could have more connections open to the server at a time and request more like you know maps, tiles, or whatever. People started concatenating all their images or their they're spriting all their images together, concatenating their JavaScript and their CSS together, so you didn't have to uh, have lots of re didn't have to do lots of requests to the server. So people thought maybe we should just fix HTTP instead. So around 2009, Google had a browser, Google had lots of servers, of course, so people started experimenting with a protocol called Speedy, and this became the basis of HTTP2. So if this is what a request looked like in 1989, it's very, it's text, it's verbose, this is an HTTP2 request. 
around 2012. Another way to look at that is like this, where the fields are, there's a nine byte header for every, uh, every frame of HTTP. There's three bytes saying the length of the frame. There's one byte saying what the frame type is, and we'll go over the, like the 10 current frame types. There's one byte for flags for that uh, frame. And then there's the stream ID, which is you can think of as kind of a unique request ID on that connection. And then you actually have the payload of, you know, in this case, 12 bytes. So in HTTP2, the browser and the server, the client and server, can exchange these frames basically in any order. And so you could have multiple requests outstanding. The server can reply in different orders. The server could intermix uh, responses with other ones. Um, so one little quick demo of HTTP2 and HTTP1. Consider this example where we have a whole bunch of little tiles. We have 180 tiles of a gopher in this case. And you can see the browser's six connections at a time, especially if we go to one second latency. So imagine we're like in a cabin in the woods or on an airplane and we're using a satellite internet connection where you actually have one second of latency. You can see six tiles at a time loading here. So this is HTTP 1 with 30 millisecond latency. Now if we change that to HTTP 2, you see like you still see the 200 millisecond pause or the one second pause, but then the browser actually asked for all 180 at the same time, then it took a second, and then all 180 came back all together. So this really helps on uh, pages that have lots of resources, which is basically all pages nowadays. So the different types of frames in HTTP2, there are settings, pings, blah, blah, we'll go through all these. Uh, the setting frame lets the two sides, the client and the server exchange, you know, what their capabilities are. This is how things are upgradable. Uh, ping lets either side say, hey, are you still there? Headers and continuation are two different types of frames, but you can really just think of them as the same type. This is how you send request headers for new requests or you send response headers. Uh, data, this is the request body of a HTTP request or the response body. Go away is how a server does graceful shutdown. So you could do things like have a server tell you that it's shutting down soon, and if you happen to be sending a request from the browser at the same time, the browser would know that, oh, the request I sent is greater than what the server said the last one it will process. So you can know that you can safely retransmit a post. Reset stream is how you kill a, kill a request without killing the whole TCP connection. For instance, you can you know, abort a download, but keep all your other requests still going and not close that TCP connection. Window update is how you give the uh, give the peer more flow control tokens. Everything in HTTP2 is flow controlled, so you cannot send data unless you've gotten permission from the other side. Uh, priority, you can also tell, the browsers can tell the server the order that it wants requests in, the relative order. Th this part is optional. Push promise is another optional feature. This lets a server send answers to a browser that the browser didn't ask for. So for instance, the browser could ask for the front page of your site and the server might know that the, you know, the might recognize that client or might have a good reason to believe that that client has an old version of the CSS or the JavaScript or something. And the server can send a hypothetical request and a hypothetical answer. And if the browser wants to use it, it can rather than doing another full round trip. Anyway, back to headers. This was an HTTP request for, uh, HTTP2 request for sending headers. These nine bytes here, or these 12 bytes here, are HPAC compressed headers. HPAC is a new compression format that's built for HTTP2 that basically just encodes key value pairs and a list, a table of key value pairs. Um, the spec defines a static table, which is a bunch of common header names and header values that are you know, seen in the wild. And the HPAC compression refers to this table, so you can encode, for instance, you want to say status 400 or 404, you could just say 13 and encode it a uh, variable size uh, integer, make that really small. Um, also, there's a dynamic table that's adjusted as you send requests on that connection. So if I say, you know, authority, this is like the host header, if I say www.example.com, I only have to say that on the first request and afterwards it gets a small number that you can refer to on subsequent requests. This also works, for instance, on really long user agents or cookie headers. Um, on, on next ones, it's only a few bytes. 
So yeah, you can see in this case, you actually see www.example.com encoded on the first request, and then on the second request, it's gone. You see instead it's just doing an indexed add, uh, index 62, and that results in authority www.example.com. Also, all the strings that you send, the string literals, can be Huffman encoded optionally. So common bytes, um, for instance here, like the number one only takes five bits of output, whereas if you're sending something really rare, like, you know, less than sign, that's 15 bits, or if you're sending byte 31, that's 28 bits of output. Um, so as you're doing requests, not only are things compressed uh, at the character level, but also they're delta compressed relative to previous requests you've made, so you don't even have to send uh, key value pairs. Uh, the way you upgrade to HTTP2, it, over HTTPS, at the same time you're doing the cipher suite negotiation and protocol negotiation for, H, uh, for TLS, you can also say what protocol you want to speak after the TLS handshake is done. And you send a list of strings where, where the string is the protocol name you want to support. So the client can say, I prefer speaking HTTP2, and then draft 14 of the HTTP2 spec, and then maybe after that HTTP 1.1. Or if you don't agree on the the protocol, the default is falling back to HTTP 1.1. Uh, for HTTP 2, or HTTP, uh, normal HTTP without HTTPS, there is technically a way to do it, but nobody really encrypt, or nobody really uh, supports it. So everyone should just use Let's Encrypt probably and get a cert. In conclusion, HTTP 1 is a text protocol. You can do one thing at a time. HTTP 2 is a binary protocol. You can do many things at a time. But other than that, the semantics are the same. Get, post, cookies, everything works the same. You don't have to change your application. So there's a package, golang.org xnet http 2 that implements uh, the HTTP2 protocol. We say that it's a very low level package and intended to be used by very few people directly. If you actually just want to use HTTP2 as a user, you should just use go1.6 and it's all automatic. But if you do want to use the HTTP2 package, there's tons of crap in there that you're welcome to use. Um, I'm going to walk through some of that so you understand this package. Uh, at the base, we'll start at frame type. A frame type is just a uint8, and we have constants for the 10 types of frames. There's another type called flags that's just a uint8, and we have a bunch of the uh, flags from the spec defined. There's a frame header. This represents that 9-byte header that's at the beginning of all HTTP2 frames with the uh, type flags length and the stream ID. There's functions for reading that little 9-byte header from a reader. Then there's a framer type that, given a writer and a reader, returns a framer. And that framer has a method like read frame that returns a frame interface with one of the 10 concrete types. And then a whole bunch of writer methods to write certain frame types. Here's one of the specific concrete types of frames. This is a go away frame. Then there's a HTTP2 server in there that only speaks HTTP2. Uh, that could be a whole talk by itself. And then there's the HTTP2 transport, which only speaks HTTP2. It has the requisite round trip method, so it's an HTTP round tripper, and it can be used with the HTTP2 client, or the HTTP client. So we have two packages. We have the net HTTP package, which is what everyone knows. That's how you make requests, get requests via server. And then we have the HTTP2 package, which has all the low-level nasty stuff that you have to use if you're like, for instance, gRPC or somebody who's like doing low-level HTTP2 stuff. Um, but our goal for Go1.6 was HTTP2 just works. No options, no new API surface. We wanted to be completely transparent. So how are we going to depend on these? How are we going to merge these packages together? One problem is the HTTP2 package already depends on the HTTP package because it has you know methods like transport, uh, round trip, which take an HTTP request a concrete type. And the HTTP package, we want to depend on HTTP2 because we want it to be automatic and be uh, linked in. But we can't do this because you can't have a circular dependency. So Alan Donovan wrote a tool called Bundle. And Bundle takes some flags and tell you, I want to make this package merging into this package. And so now, instead of having two packages, we have one big fat package when we merge HTTP2 into HTTP. And we have this file now, h2bundle.go, that's auto-generated with go generate, so you can see this line here. And it's basically all the files in the HTTP2 package merged into one, and it's 5,800 lines of code, 
all the met names are mangled, so you can see like the server type from HTTP2 is now called HTTP2 server, and constants like default max streams are now HTTP2 default max streams. So you don't actually modify this file directly, you always hack on the HTTP2 sources and just slurp back into here. As far as tests, tests are in both places, and you have to run uh, the tests from HTTP2, and go generate, and then run the tests in the main repo. Uh, so the goal, like I said, was it just works, it's on by default. We document how to turn it off if you really have to, and if you have to turn it off, that's basically a bug, and we tell you to go file a bug. Um, but it should just work by default and on, and you shouldn't have to touch it. Um, the way it actually works is in HTTP, in the main HTTP package, in the net HTTP, on the server, there's a field here called TLS next proto, and this documents, or this specifies how after the TLS negotiation, when you have uh, the negotiated protocol string like H2, how you map that to the next code that runs. So this has actually been in here for three years since Go 1.1, and it was added for Speedy originally. What is new in 1.6 is that the server now has this unexported sync.once that auto wires up your TLS proto for you. So at the beginning of, for instance, the serve method and a couple other places, uh, you, this is safe from use for multiple Go routines because it's using sync.once. It will call this function once set next proto defaults. And that basically just checks, you know, that you haven't explicitly disabled the HTTP2 server with uh, Go debug. And then if you haven't set your TLS next proto, uh, and it's still nil, then we run HTTP2 configure server for you. HTTP, HTTP2's configure server uh, does things like sees if you have a TLS config. If you don't have a TLS config, makes it one. If you do have a TLS config, verifies that your Cypher suites are compliant with HTTP2 spec, you know, make sure that you have, uh, you know, that Cypher suite, for instance. And then this is the meat of it. It registers two map keys for you, one for H2 and one for H214 that says when a new connection comes in and ALPN negotiates that it's going to be H2, then it calls HTTP2 server serve con with the new TLS connection that just came in with that handler and that config from your HTTP1 options. And that is pretty simple. The transport has something very similar. It has a TLS next proto that maps from the protocol name to a slightly different signature, and we're gonna. That's kind of the end of this talk is how the transport works. Why? Why are these different? This is the server one, and this is the client one. So we want for the HTTP/2 client, we want these to just work. You don't know ahead of time what protocol a site speaks. You just want to be able to say HTTP GET or default client GET or default transport do and do some hit some URL and speak the right protocol. So which transport should you start with? We have the HTTP1 transport that only speaks HTTP1, and we have the HTTP2 transport which only speaks HTTP2. So you have these two packages conceptually, even if they've been merged into one, they're still two separate packages. Which one is going to call into the other and when? Should the HTTP2 transport start? So maybe the HTTP2 default transport is actually an HTTP2 one, and it checks to see if it has a cached connection, and if so, it calls HTTP2 round trip. If it doesn't have a cached connection, maybe it'll dial one, and then after the ALPN finishes, if it is an ALPN, says it's H2 protocol, then it'll call HTTP2 round trip. If it's not, maybe then it will call HTTP1 round trip, but it already has a connection, and HTTP1 thinks it has to dial, so what do you do with that connection? Um, do we reuse that connection? Do we kind of like... Do we give that connection back to the HTTP 1 package? But that would involve adding new API, and that was an explicit goal of HTTP 1.6 was to not new add new API. So we're not going to do that. Instead, we're going to make the HTTP transport start. But it kind of has to be that way anyway, because if you look at the HTTP package, the default transport, even though it's declared as type round tripper as an interface, we can't really change the underlying concrete type because there's too much code in the wild that does stuff like this. HTTP2 default transport and does a, a static type assertion that it's HTTP transport. And this would basically violate our Go1 API promise that we're changing the underlying type. So we really want to do something like, is there a cached HTTP1 connection? Use it. If not, dial. 
And if we get the ALPN string, then we'll check the transport next proto. But we also have to deal with connection caching. And we want to make sure that if we do like four HTTP gets in a row that only keeps one connection, only ever makes one and reuses one and not four. So instead of just checking the H1 connection cache and using it, we also want to check the H2 connection cache and use that. Otherwise, we want to dial. But how are we going to make the HTTP1 transport check the HTTP2's transport cache? So as a little aside and as part of the answer about how we're going to fix this, there is a feature in Go since the very beginning that lets you access FTP or Gopher or whatever URLs with the HTTP package as long as you've registered them ahead of time with the register protocol method on transport. And this never allowed you to register the HTTPS scheme before. It always panicked until Go 1.6. So we've both permitted now this to be HTTPS and we've added this bit that the round tripper can return this magic sentinel air type, air skip alt protocol that if you return that, it acts as if the protocol were never registered and handles HTTPS normally. So putting it all together, what we want to build is this. We call HTTP1's transport, and we see, is there an HTTP2 connection to this host already, to this authority? And if so, use it. Otherwise, do we have an HTTP1 connection cached? If we do, we'll just use it. If we don't have either cached, we make a new TCP connection, do the TLS handshake, and if we don't know what it is, we'll assume it's HTTP 1.1 and we'll just speak HTTP 1. If we do get the H2 string from the ALPN protocol, then we'll give this connection to the HTTP 2 package and let it use it. So the way this ends up looking like in code, in the HTTP package, we have transports round trip. It does the same thing as the server with the embedded sync.once, which ends up ultimately calling HTTP 2 configure transport. HTTP2 configure transport, its job is to make the provided HTTP1 transport automatically wired up with HTTP2. The way it does this is it makes a HTTP2 client pool. It then makes a new HTTP2 transport specifying the client pool, but it modifies the client pool into one that does not ever dial. So it never initiates its own uh, outbound TCP connections. And then it keeps a reference to the HTTP1 transport and it uses this as its own configuration. So you don't have to configure both transports. Then it registers the HTTPS protocol, and it gives it a round tripper that is a modified version of the HTTP2 round tripper, the HTTP2 transport, that will never dial itself. The no dialing HTTP2 round tripper basically just calls the HTTP2 round tripper, but if that one doesn't have a cached connection, and remember we gave it a no dial client con pool, so if it doesn't have one, it will immediately fail with air no cached con. We convert that error into the magic value that the HTTP package wants, which is error skip alt protocol, which tells it to just keep going on and do whatever you would do as if this HTTPS protocol were never registered. Then the rest of configured transport does things like, if you don't have a TLS config, we make one for you. And then if you don't already have the H2 protocol added, we prepend it to your list. And if you don't have the HTTP 1.1 protocol, we also add that because some sites, if you do any ALPN at all, they require you to say that you also know how to speak HTTP 1.1. And then we initialize this map. Remember the TLS Next Proto one maps for the transport and maps from the protocol name you want, like H2, to a function that takes the authority, which is like the host part of the URL, the new connection that you just made, and it returns a round tripper to use for that. So the bottom of HTTP2 configure transport makes that map and it says for H2, the func that will run was canonicalize that authority, the host header, and then add it, add this connection that we just made to the connection pool, which we're closing over. We have a reference from the top of the function. And if we have an error adding that connection, we'll close that connection and we'll return a round tripper that just returns that error. If we don't need that connection, because maybe we already have one in our pool, remember we only need one HTTP2 connection, we close that one. And then regardless, we return a reference to our HTTP2 transport, and the main net HTTP package will then use T2. And now T2 will work because we've now donated this connection to it with addcon if needed. So in the HTTP package, this is how the round tripper works. It called, it configured the transport, and then it looks in the alt protocol, so this is the thing that 
was originally designed for like file URLs or Gopher or FTP, and it finds HTTPS, and it calls the alternate round tripper. And this one, if it was not air skip alt protocol, um, it will just return it. If it was alt, if it was skip protocol, it'll just proceed down here, and now it has to dial. So there's a connect method for request either finds a cached connection or makes a new one. If it found a, an existing one, it goes through this path here, HTTP1. But if it did have to end up doing a, a, TL, a new connection and a new TLS setup, it would end up running the function here that returns a new T2. And T2 gets put into this alt field. And then it calls persistent connection alternate round tripper and it calls that. And that's about it. What we've built for the HTTP transport is that a connection comes in checks that the HTTP2 connection is cached. The way it does that is via register alt proto on HTTPS and tries the no dial round tripper. If that fails, it goes down to air skip alt proto. That calls get connect method for request. We either have a cached connection, which we do a HTTP1 round trip. If we don't have a cached connection, dial CCP and does the ALPN handshake. If we recognize the ALPN string as H2, then we add the connection if needed and we ultimately call no dial round tripper and that one will now succeed. Otherwise, if we don't recognize the ALPN string, we default to the HTTP 1.1 round tripper. So that's the path we wanted to build. Cool, thank you.